Welcome to the Bleeding Metal podcast once again and Happy New Year. This is our first episode of 2023. I am Kiki, she, her, and as always, I am joined by my co-host. Pia, she, her, hello. And today we have a special guest joining us. Would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, yeah, my name is Gina Lucia, she, her as well. This is so nice to have you here. I know Gina through Twitch, as our listeners know. I uh, stream from time to time on Twitch. And also we have a small but really cool community nowadays. And Gina is kind of part of our extended community. So it's really nice to to be able to cross all of the different <laughs> cyberspaces, kind of, <laughs> and have you here uh, to talk about your own community, your um, internet presence, because you have a really cool YouTube channel about uh, reading. Tell us all about it. Yeah, so um, I have a YouTube channel that I've been running for about two years now. Um, and it's kind of, I always find it really hard to explain what it is because I talk about books in its basic form, but I kind of talk about reading psychology and, um, you know, everything that goes around or with reading rather than just kind of talking about the books themselves. So I kind of explain it like, They're almost like uh, video essays. So I go like, I do deep dives into specific topics that honestly just come out of my mind rather than, rather than anything that's kind of like a basic talking about all the books I've been reading. I kind of dive a little deeper and I'm really interested in how the brain works and psychology, especially when it comes to reading. So I really mm -hmm. enjoy talking about those things and looking at you know, studies and everything that goes with all of these topics and having a well-rounded argument in the videos. So that's what the videos are about in a nutshell. That is really cool. So yeah. essentially what we do, but instead of uh, music, it's about books. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And do you choose specific books like um, scientific books or novels or stuff like that? Or is it everything? Well, when I originally started my channel, I actually didn't start talking about books at all. I um, started off talking about personal development stuff. And then um, I moved on from personal development to business related stuff because I also run my own business. And then I kind of ventured into books and I've stuck with that. So when I first started doing videos, I talked about a lot of nonfiction books and in particular kind of personal development stuff or um, stuff to do with like working routines um, and like digital minimalism and things like that. But now all the books that I talk about are mostly fiction because that's mostly what I read. Um, a lot of like fantasy and mythology and some dystopian thrown in there. So those are the kind of books that I focus on. So some of the videos that I've got topics on will probably focus on those. Um, but then the others are just kind of more generic kind of themes within reading as such cool you just mentioned also about your own business etc so i would really like to just uh, get to know you a little better uh, can you tell us from the very beginnings have you always been a big reader uh, since you were a kid how was your upraising um etc yeah so um growing up i grew up in a really creative family in general and so they always encouraged you know um creative stuff whether that was like drawing and everything so I grew up doing that and through that and reading I had a lot of interest in fantasy I've always had an interest in fantasy through drawing and reading um 
And so before I went to university, I kind of just got more and more interested in that and started creating my own stories. Um, and then I went to university and did a creative writing degree because I thought, well, that's my main interest. And when you're, when you're wow. that age, I don't know if you guys remember, but I actually didn't know what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. creative writing just seemed like a fit. <laughs> but I remember when I went to one of my first lectures, it was literally the introduction lecture that we all had. And mm -hmm. um, the head of creative writing for the year announced to everybody who was doing creative writing, only like 9% of the people in this room will ever make money from writing. Mm -hmm. And that was Oof. literally the first thing he said to everybody. And my stomach just dropped because I thought, why are we here and why has he said this? Yeah. Um, and then I went through my creative writing degree with various ups and downs. And when I finished, I remember feeling like, what was the point in that? Like, what did I gain mm -hmm. from it? And then after university, there was kind of a job crisis. It was really hard to find work in the UK and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure everywhere else, honestly. And um, so my parents actually were running a graphic design business and they'd kind of been pairing it back a bit. But both me and my brother, who's four years older, were struggling to find work. So we brought that business back to life as a web development and design business. And we did that for a few years, but um, we decided to part ways and he got a job and I created my own business, essentially. And um, mm -hmm. it started off as doing websites and I did a lot of websites for authors, actually. But then I figured out that they don't have money <laughs> unless mm -hmm. they're working with a publisher. And um, I ended up finally using my creative writing degree and um, turned it into a content writing business instead. And so that's where I am at now, essentially. So it all kind of comes full circle. And now I look back at that lecturer who said that nobody would make money. And I think, well, he didn't see content marketing coming. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a win for me. Yeah. <laughs> that is super interesting though. And may I say also how courageous in general to go into the arts? <laughs> um, because there, that's just the, the way society works still nowadays. Uh, there are these two big categories of things you can study, right? The things that will guarantee you a job and for sure make you money and the things that um, will for sure feed your soul, but <laughs> <laughs> the rest is yet to be seen, kind of. <laughs> or at least that is, uh, yeah, I think that's also cultural. That is how we, how our parents thought and so how they taught us kind of. And uh, yeah, the internet changed a lot of that stuff and not everything for the better, but everything needs communication. Everything needs to be well-written. Storytelling is such a buzzword nowadays and has been for years, but because it's so important to have anything you read um, be something you can connect with as well. You can uh, react to emotionally, even if it is, um, I don't know, a television ad or if it is a great uh, novel, right? You yeah. have to be able to connect to something. Yeah, I think I was actually really lucky in general because my parents were creative anyway. And they also both, like my dad was a painter and now he creates video online video and um, moving picture and photography and my mom used That's to so do cool. photography and now she does sculpture so I kind of had that influence of you know creativity is is very important and it's worth you know um, trying to find a way to make that work for you or at least slot it into your life in some shape or form um, mm -hmm. even if you go through some pain <laughs> yeah. to get it to happen or get it to work so I I mean, I also had that kind of um, drive that because I grew up with them running their own business, essentially, mm -hmm. I had that influence and I knew that when I was trying to find a job, it wouldn't work anyway. And um, so I had that drive thinking, well, I have to make my own business work, you know, no matter what, because um, it's the only way that I'm going to actually have some kind of enjoyment when it comes to work, because I'm just not suited to being employed 
I don't mm. do well being told what to do, essentially. <laughs> I can relate. I think it was Buddha who said, um, success doesn't lead to happiness, but happiness will lead to success because when you love what you're doing, you will be successful anyway. So yeah. I think that fits very well here. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that could open another very, <laughs> very long uh, philosophical discussion that I would love to go into. But I'm also thinking about how your YouTube channel fits into into your professional life in that way. Is it something you use for promoting your uh, content uh, business or um, is it just something you do for fun that is bringing you a little bit um, more than that nowadays? I um, try my very hardest to keep them completely separate. Whoa. I, don't, I don't want any of my clients knowing <laughs> that I have a YouTube channel if I can help it just because um, one of the things that's really important to me is having a really strong balance between you know, what I consider work and this is, st it's still work, my YouTube channel, but it's a different kind that, you know, brings me more fulfillment than, you know, the stuff I do for clients. Um, I still enjoy the stuff I do for clients, but this is just different. It kind of tickles that creative need. And so in my mind, I kind of feel like if those start to get mixed and people from work start commenting on videos or you know sharing them amongst each other like I'll feel like like a boundary has been crossed <laughs> you know in my mind where mm -hmm. that's separate and I I don't need them to know about it even if it would kind of help share it further you know on yeah. a logical level I don't want those mixing um so what I tend to do is I mean the beauty of kind of working for myself is that I can completely um, tailor my schedule to suit absolutely everything and cover everything. Um, but I also prioritize my spare time too, because I need that as well. I'm an introvert and I do a lot of thinking during the day and, and, you know, writing takes a lot of your brain and YouTube mm -hmm. takes even more. Um, so I need to make sure that although I'm creating a video a week, that I have that time off. So I'll typically do, I'm going to go through my schedule. And I don't know if that's even interesting. Yes, hell yes. <laughs> so on the Monday, I'll write a rough draft of the script of the video. And that usually means that I'm doing a lot of um, research and finding all the studies and everything, which takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And I'll usually fit that in around doing client work on the Monday. And then on the Thursday, I'll go over that script and give it some more personality and flesh it out. And then I'll plan all the filming that I need to do. And I'll film everything and edit everything on Friday. So essentially, clients know that I don't work on Thursdays. They don't know what I do on Thursdays, <laughs> but they know I don't work on Thursdays. And on Fridays, they, I don't tell them that I don't work. But usually people don't really contact you on a Friday unless it's an emergency because um, other people have boundaries too. <laughs> so um, that's usually how I do it. And some weeks it's a lot easier because the video is shorter. And some weeks it's quite difficult because the video is long and intensive. Last week I put together a video on AI writing tools in the book industry. Mm -hmm. And... I went really deep with that one because it's such a huge topic, especially right now. And it yeah. ended up being an 18 minute video and it took forever to put together. And so by the end of the week, I was, I was just exhausted. So this week I'm doing a much simpler video to give that balance back. So that's kind of how I fit it in. Um, but I never, I always say that if I'm really having a rough time, I will just skip a week if I need to, because it's just mm -hmm. so important when you're, you know, when you're creating content online, if you're not feeling, you know, mentally okay in that week, then it's fine to take a break. And I really try and prioritize that as well. Just because, you know, I have friends um, and you guys, you know, you create content online and I'd give people that advice. So you have to kind of do it yourself, don't you? So that's what I try and do. 
Totally. That is really, really important. Also to know yourself well enough that you can recognize when you need that, when you need that downtime, that uh, space for yourself, for recharging your energy. And um, in the end, it's just good for the content as well, because you will not, one cannot be productive 100% of the time. <laughs> and if you're um, tired, overwhelmed, stressed, uh, the, the quality of the content will, will not be the same. Yeah. I honestly, I feel, sometimes I feel awful when I put out a video that's still a good video, but it's not what I wanted it to be, or it's not as in depth as I wanted it to be, or as creative as I wanted it to be, because I was just, I just didn't have the energy to do it because either something was happening in my life or client work got a bit out of control that month or something. Um, so yeah, having that balance is important. And I also don't think a lot of people who, people who don't create content online don't really realize how much of yourself you put into that work. And so I'm always really conscious, especially now that I've, I've been doing it, that if somebody, you know, you can see who's creating some kind of content online, whether they're streaming or, or a podcast like this or creating videos, if it's not up to the usual quality, you know, it's not necessarily that they haven't put as much effort in. It's there's a, there's more to it than that, you know? So just about mm -hmm. cutting people a bit of slack and we're not robots we can we are not ai exactly you, know? you were just talking about the ai video and i just watched it it was really interesting all of the potential that it has ai in the arts uh whether it's ethical or not it's just right now everywhere everybody's talking about it and it's just a really interesting development of technology that video for example even got a little bit philosophical, political, that is the part that I like um, the most about your channel. And because it's, it's those kinds of conversations that I like to have the most, the ones that go like really deep and into our culture, which is why we have this podcast in general, to talk about the, the topics that it can seem uh, trivial sometimes, but uh, are actually deeper than, than we think they are. And The other video of yours that also was super interesting to me is the one about audiobooks, whether they count as real reading or not. And the part that I didn't expect was the part about how um, audio content is so important for uh, people who are seeing impaired. And I think it's just really, uh, really interesting how you can think about all of these topics. And as you were saying, put in the, the, the effort of researching everything that is behind books and publishing and everything that influences our lives as well. I think I've always kind of, I've always been really interested in kind of a well-rounded argument that includes everyone. Because one of the things that I think one of the things that heavily influenced me was while I was at university, I specifically remember this one of the, I'm always relating back to university. I'm not sure why, but I remember this one specific um, class that we had and our lecturer asked us all to think in our heads, how many books we have read ever. And this was, you know, this was before people were really using Goodreads to track how many books they were reading. And people in my class could just think off the top of their head, however many books they've read. And it was in the hundreds, you know, and I'm 18 at this point. And wow. I was thinking, I have no idea. How am I supposed to know that? And then, so we all had to have a number in our head. And then she split us into groups of how many books we'd read. And so mm -hmm. people who had read, like there were some people that had read a thousand books. And I thought, no, no, you didn't. <laughs> and then there were... So, and then she ranked us all in our groups, put us in order in the room. And I thought of the number of books I had read and I thought, maybe it's that. And then I asked the person next to me, I was like, how many have you read? And they said like a number. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's probably that too. And so I just said a couple of books underneath theirs because I didn't know. And then I was in like maybe the second to last group of how many books we'd read. And 
the 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 aim of that exercise was to show that the more books you read, the better writer you'll be because you know you're more well read. This, that, and the other. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. But the actual result of that exercise was to make the people who had read more look down on the people who had read less. Right. To shame you, kind yes. of. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I just thought, this doesn't feel right. Mm. Like, why, why am I being placed somewhere, depending on how much I read, that has nothing to do with the ability of each of the writers in the group? Mm -hmm. So an experience like that just kind of had a knock-on effect through, you know, through my life. And then creating these videos, I just know that it bothers me when people essentially are elitist when it comes to reading and mm -hmm. are kind of snobby about it and look down on people for either the genres of books they read or the types of books they read or how many pages the books they read have or the number of books or the how, language the language <laughs> or the medium or right. anything mm -hmm. because in my mind i'm like well they're reading why does it matter yeah. like the point of reading is to enjoy books yeah i was gonna say that because that's something that is still in the heads of a lot of people that mm -hmm. reading a lot of books makes you a more intelligent person or something so mm -hmm. um, but there are several reasons that people may not be able to read so much. Maybe they have disabilities. Maybe they have to work more because they don't earn that much money with their job. They need a second job, stuff like that. So maybe they just a, don't have access to books yeah. or, or to as many books as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of weird classism here. Yeah. 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 And in the case of the audiobooks in particular, I kind of, so whenever I go into like, creating a video like that or when I go into the planning stage I always kind of have an opinion and in that case it was yeah it's reading and then I do all of the research that I possibly can to find the actual you know studies or what people have said online and and all of the different opinions to piece them together into one hopefully well-rounded argument and so for that one I you know had the feeling that People who are visually impaired would find audiobooks useful, but I didn't have the kind of proof on that thought. So I did the research to find studies and articles online, and it things like that kind of make me feel good because I can share that information with people who might have had a knee-jerk reaction or opinion to our audiobooks reading and be like, well, yes, they are, and here's why. And this opinion that you might have had before, I'm potentially going to change it. And by the end of each video, people can still have the same opinion if they want. But I'm hoping to have given them enough information that they can maybe change their mind if they're open-minded. And yeah, in the case of the audiobooks, actually, I really enjoyed putting that one together in particular because I get to learn at the same time. And that makes me happy because I'm, um, you know, widening my scope of empathy for other people as well. And so mm -hmm. I did that in, as well in a video which was um, about dark academia and that genre of books and why it's suddenly come up and become so popular. And then there's a whole kind of subculture around that. Um which needs talking about as well. And, and throughout making that video, I learned a lot um, doing that too. And it just, that is part of why I enjoy making these videos. They're a lot of work, but I enjoy making them so much because I can also learn a lot myself and grow as a person myself. And um, so, yeah, I always want to make sure I talk about those because I never want to be the type of person that just says, oh, here's how to read more because you should be reading more. Because it's not about that. It's just about if, mm -hmm. if somebody's watching my videos and they would actually like to read more books, then they might get something. But if not, I, don't, I honestly, I don't care. I just want them to read if they want to read. If they don't, they can just watch the videos and enjoy them, you know? Yeah. And so what you were saying before about changing a person's opinion, I think even if you don't, 
if they uh, if you have reassured them in their opinion um you at least have given them more perspective mm -hmm. just like what you were saying for yourself you uh know more about the subject and then um, maybe yeah your opinion will be you will maintain it but at least you will you will have another perspective and your argument will be better have a better foundation I was also just thinking about uh, no, uh, a comparison to the audiobook thing. I recently listened to a podcast about audio description of shows and movies and how important that is for the uh, yeah for the seeing impaired as well and how how difficult it can be because it's not just about describing what's happening in the in on the screen but also transmitting all those all those feelings all that atmosphere and how it works better nowadays when the directors and the producers and the people making the films and the shows actually take that into account and leave the space um, between the dialogues for the narrator to come in and describe everything and how that can have a can create a better narr narrative when it's intertwined together well instead of something is produced for people who can watch it and then adapt it for people who actually have to consume it in a different way. So that was super interesting to me to have both of those perspectives, um, the one from audiobooks and the one from audio description, you know, two ways of consuming completely different media through the ears And I, I, I got both of those informations kind of at the same time, watching your video and uh, listening to this other podcast that I will try to link in the show notes, just to put it out there. I will also link uh, your videos that we have talked about so far in the description. And now I would like to go back to that point about the snobbery of reading, because, uh, yeah, as Pia was also saying, that is something our society still thinks that is just uh, not necessarily true. But I also grew up with that. I remember my mom, when she would uh, introduce me to people or or. or talk about me to friends or stuff like that. She would always say that I read a lot. Mm -hmm. And I never, I've never thought of myself as a big book reader. But I think maybe it's still internalized in myself even to try to read more, to have that, like, that's the virtue, right? Is it a thing you have too? I can remember that when I went to language classes that one of the other students asked me how much I read. And I really had to think about that because I was in uh, in my job already and I ca I came to the conclusion that I don't read any books anymore at all because I read the whole day um, because my job uh, contains a lot of reading so um, right I don't know if that makes me a person who is not reading or if that makes me a person who's reading a lot because it's part of my job so um That was a point where I was like, oh, well, in the past, I used to read a lot in my spare time and being forced to read that much throughout the day that took away the, not necessarily the joy, but I was longing for other stimulations for mm -hmm. the brain. So um, there was no need for me to read letters on a on paper or stuff like that anymore. So yeah, I think when I was a child, I read a lot there was always a book that I carried with me also when I was in university and when I uh, whenever I had a, a long way to travel and then I would either take a book with me or if I had to drive the car then I had audiobooks so that someone else reads them to me <laughs> and that kind of changed so yeah I don't know if that answers your question but that are my thoughts on <laughs> what you just said <laughs> But do you aim to read more? Is that something you would like to um, incorporate in your life? Mm, not really. So I'm happy with not reading that much. There are books that um, that I find interesting and I would like to find the time to read them, but I don't want to read more in general. There are mm -hmm. just okay. some books that I say I want to read them. Um, yeah, now or, <laughs> now or later. <laughs> Right. I think it's really interesting. So while I was at university, we had to read mm -hmm. specific books. And um, like I said earlier, I hate being told what to do. Mm -hmm. So reading some of those, I absolutely hated it because we were reading them and then analyzing them. 
and it just sucked the joy out of reading for me. Mm -hmm. And after university, I spent almost 10 years not reading at all. Wow. Because I was just so overwhelmed and burnt out with the idea of picking up a book that I just didn't read again. And I actually asked um, on a poll on my YouTube channel a while ago if anybody else had some kind of situation like that where they had a period in their life where they fell out of love with reading, essentially. And quite a few people have those similar experiences because there are just points in your life where you just don't want to read or you don't feel like you have the motivation or you don't feel like you can read. And I don't think that's a problem at all. I think it's just, you know, you go through like seasons in life where things change and you have different interests. And throughout those 10 years, I spent more time gaming than reading. But that still gave me the same kind of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. It was just different. And I think, you know, when people who are big readers look at people who aren't, sometimes, not everyone, but sometimes they will think, well, you're not a reader, so I have nothing in common with you. Or, you know, you'll have certain opinions about people who don't read, but it's it's just not necessary because sometimes people just get into a point in their life where they're just not a reader at that point. But I just don't think it matters at all. It took me so long to find reading again. And even then, I'm not reading as much as I did when I was a kid because I just don't have the time and I'm an adult now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's pretty common. And then people start to feel bad about that. Yeah. You know, if they used to be a reader and they're thinking, well, I should read more. Why aren't I reading more? My New Year's resolution is to read more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that kind of thing. And it's just such a toxic attitude because it's not fair to yourself. Um. You know, you don't necessarily need to read more. You, if you want to, you know, pick up a book. But if you don't, that, that's completely okay. It's not, I think it's, if we're brought up to kind of have this idea that a, a good person reads, mm -hmm. then, you know, you grow up thinking that, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Is there a benefit or did you find in your research a benefit f for reading compared to maybe gaming or watching a movie or something like that? Because in the end, I can do anything that I can do with books. Also with, for example, uh, TV, I can uh, watch fiction. I can watch something that um, that is teaching me something just for entertainment, stuff like that. So um, did you find a difference maybe also that um reading is is not as stimulating for the brain than the others or what are your thoughts and research um yeah experience from that on that topic so i've never done any research specifically on that but that would be really interesting um my gut reaction is that a bit like in the audiobook um video when I was talking about the comparison between reading with your eyes and essentially reading with your ears is that the difference is so small because essentially it's story and gaming is story. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a friend actually ask me when I was after that video, she said, oh, do you think listening to podcasts counts as reading? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, technically, you know, reading, especially in the context of that video is you know, the, it was started as a book first. So that is what kind of reading is technically, but you're still learning when you're listening to a podcast or you're still experiencing a story. If you're listening to a podcast, it's just, it's just a different type of consuming entertainment or consuming, you know, a story or something that you enjoy. So I see no difference because I know I have friends that are kind of, They love movies and that's their thing. And they love knowing all the actors behind it and and the directors and everybody involved. And they like particular visual storytelling. Mm -hmm. But I prefer words. That's the only difference I can see. And I think now as well, especially with gaming, it went through such a long period of people thinking that if you're a gamer, then you're um, like a good for nothing that just wastes all your time playing game, right? Mm -hmm. 
But now it's people are starting to realize that actually gaming can be really good for your mental health yeah. and it can give you that kind of creative output and you can learn and grow while playing games. And I just don't think people realize that for such a long time. So I don't see it being any different to reading at all, honestly. Mm. Yeah, because I also think about, for example, Assassin's Creed, where you have these historical environment and yes you can read about that but in video games you can walk through that experience maybe it's not it. yeah you can experience that maybe it's not um how it was in the original setting but who knows if that what is described in books is the real thing so that's basically the same then yeah yeah i really um so one of the types of genres that i really enjoy reading is um greek mythology retellings and I just really enjoy kind of um, in particular the kind of feminist take on those retellings and there's a lot of them now. They keep coming out, there's more and more. Nice. And so one of the things I really like to think of is that, you know, there are a lot of people who like Greek mythology in general and, you know, there are games like Hades that incorporates that so well that I think is kind of on par with some of the books I've read because you're still getting a lot mm -hmm. of information about mm -hmm. Greek mythology but it's in a different format and you get to see it visually it's just slightly different and so yeah I would totally agree I think that you get slightly different things if you oh, I'm actually thinking about putting together a video on um it's called like mind blindness where you actually cannot visualize the words that you're reading and um uh -huh. something like a game would be really good For somebody like that because mm -hmm. you would get a, a similar experience but you can actually see it visually so there's so many layers to all of these things and i think a lot of people jump to just immediate conclusions or gut reactions to what's better and what's not and it's just not that clear cut at all yeah that's another really really interesting thing that i didn't know was uh possible how people's imaginations differ as well. I had no idea that there are some people that when you describe something to them, they just can't picture it. Mm -hmm. Or they know a song, for example, and if you mention it to them, it doesn't start playing in their heads. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know how that it's a possibility. <laughs> But actually that that's happens. Yeah, and I read that only 10% of the people are daydreamers and that was something I'm a daydreamer. Same. So I was like everybody does that. What do they do when they are bored? <laughs> <laughs> and that is actually that that is something super funny that I learned uh throughout a really good friend from from our Twitch community. And it has to do with this specific Anne Rice book. I'm a huge Anne Rice fan and her books are being produced as TV shows, right? So Interview with a Vampire got a, got a show and The Lives of the Mayfair Witches uh, got their show as well. And that one, the one about the witches, just started airing this month. I was so afraid of how it would translate because this is the very first book series that I'm seeing on a screen after I read them and I know them pretty well I think so the first book I've read twice now and I was so scared about the changes they're gonna make and about this how the setting is going to be and they nailed the house the description of the house so well it's really how I imagined it and for me it was that just that gave me so much joy and When I was talking about this book uh, to this friend I was mentioning, I, I was actually reading parts of it and um, he just couldn't like picture any of any part of the house that I was describing. Uh, well, from the pages, right? While I was reading them. And that, that was so mind blowing to me that this can happen. It doesn't make an image in their heads how much of a different experience it must be for them to, to read to listen to to speech to just you know it's it's just a, like a completely different experience that than uh, what uh, people like P and I uh, go through when when enjoying some medium yeah i thought when i i actually saw it the first time because somebody shared a reel on instagram 
talking about it. And I thought, this is either a natural real thing, and if so, I need to research it immediately, or it's something someone's made up on Instagram. So I had to check, but it's real. And I just thought, I've never thought about this at all because, and I hadn't even thought about what it what it's like for me as an experience because you you generally don't you just go through your life doing life stuff, and so mm -hmm. I've started kind of paying attention when I'm reading and if I'm actually imagining it or not, and I am because I think you'd know if you weren't, and that might be why some people struggle to get into reading and they don't even know it themselves. They might just be thinking, oh this just isn't for me. I don't like it. It's a, and they might feel frustrated with themselves because their experience isn't matching up to what other people tell them that it should be. And that reading is this magical thing, this, that, and the other that they're experiencing. They might just be like, well, I'm not having that. Yeah. And so I'm just going to stop reading, but actually there might be a bit more to it than that. So it's topics like that. I just think it's like an endless supply of stuff to talk about and explore that people have just never thought about before and you're right even with you know audio descriptions and everything there's this whole world that is incredibly important to people mm -hmm. to be able to experience the things that other people experience and it might be slightly different but if we can do a job in making it better then that should definitely happen yeah which is also so important that we have this, these kinds of conversations and why book clubs are a thing, right? Or why we enjoy watching movies with other people and talking about them um, afterwards. Well, I am a, I'm outing myself right now. I am an in-between talker. <laughs> It can get annoying, but I will <laughs> ask you if I missed something, who the hell is that person? And that is something that you are doing with your, uh, with the community around your YouTube channel as well. You have your Discord server where uh, people can also uh, exchange their experiences and their perspectives. And something that you also do are the readathons. You can explain it better, but it feels like this sort of shared initiative to make time to read. So for some people still reading a little bit more or dedicating a space for reading is a goal or a priority. And um, yeah, how do they how do they work exactly? So readathons in general are, are essentially, if people listening don't know what they are, um, are essentially a set aside amount of time where you read together with other people. And they can be really, really structured with um, specific books that you read or specific themes of books or prompts and that kind of thing. Um, or they can be super casual, which is what I like to do. And they can be throughout an entire year or they can be just a couple of hours. Or for me, it's a weekend, one, one weekend a month. Um, And a lot of people who have kind of YouTube channels that talk about books, they do these amazingly, they're incredibly intricate, amazingly structured readathons where, um, you know, they have themes and everything like that. But I just knew that I wanted to take the pressure off. You know, the whole theme of my channel and everything is taking the pressure off reading. And so my readathons are essentially people gather on a weekend once a month. And we all gather in this specific kind of chat section in my Discord. And we just update each other with what we're reading. And on Instagram, I have like story templates and stuff. So it's a bit fancier. And um, yeah, people just kind of say, oh, today I'm reading this. And this is how it went. I got through this many pages. And for me, those weekends are when I read the most because I literally set out the time where, you know, I tell my husband I'm reading. Do not, do not disturb me. And mm -hmm. for other people, when they've kind of talked about doing the readathon, they've said, well, today I read this many pages and I haven't read that many pages in a month or something. Right. So it's a really good way of just getting a little bit of an extra boost if you want to get some reading done or, you know, it's like an excuse to get some reading done or If you want a little bit of um, like encouragement from other people doing it as well, it's kind of a community thing. And um, it's been growing really slowly and steadily, which is my preferred way to do things anyway. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's just nice and casual and everyone's really nice and kind. And, um, it's just a really pleasant space in general, the discord server. Um, I think one of the things that is really interesting when you're creating stuff online is, especially when you're just creating, you know, like static video is that you don't actually get to communicate with people. Right. And the discord server is my way to do that, to actually talk to people and get to know people that are watching my videos, because otherwise I just can't talk to them and I can't have a conversation with people. And this discord server allows everyone to do that. And I love it. Hell yeah. Those readathons are this kind of group uh, accountability buddies system <laughs> to get uh, the reading done that um, you want. Yeah, going back a little bit to uh, to our reading habits, I was just thinking that I always have a book uh, or two on my nightstand, but I sometimes don't touch them for ages. <laughs> And sometimes it takes me um, years <laughs> to go through a book. I love taking them on uh, airplanes and trains and, uh, you know, when I travel where I can't do anything else. But also I like a lot the fact that you are, um, yeah, that you encourage reading, but not really strictly, that it's this casual, pressureless, just finding um the enjoyment of the reading. And one thing um, I think you posted on an Instagram story probably ages ago, but that I could relate a lot to was when you finish reading a book and you feel that like grief almost, the emptiness because this is over. <laughs> and um, yeah, and now I'm grieving that our, our time together is almost over. <laughs> <laughs> already that's just this this very or the proof of how how deeply emotional the connection between a reader and and a book can be mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think especially if it's a long-running series and and you've kind of grown with those books i i've i actually created a video on this but i in that video i kind of use the example of while i was at university i read the all three hunger games books throughout the years of university mm -hmm. And so those books were with me while I was, I did a lot of growth as a person. And so when I finished the books, I just felt so empty inside because I was like, okay, well that's over. And, and then this huge part of my life is over too. And so, although I wouldn't reread the books now, because I actually don't think I would enjoy them as much as I did mm -hmm. at that age. Um, when I think about that series, you, I feel good because I grew so much with those books. And I think you can say the same for um, a series of games that you were playing or mm -hmm. you know, a film series that you loved or a TV series that you love, you know, you get attached. And um, in that video, I actually talk about in, there are things happening in your brain where you are connecting and becoming friends with characters, mm -hmm. essentially. So there's a psychological reason why you feel so bad when you finish a book that you enjoyed so much, because you're essentially like gr literally grieving the loss yeah. because you won't get to see how they move forward with their life after the book finishes. And it's exactly the same with a TV series or games or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think we have these amazing connections to stories, essentially. And um, I just love that. And I love going deep into that. So I'm not surprised. Totally. And it's <laughs> probably the reason why I am, why I haven't finished this one book I'm reading right now. <laughs> I'm kind of stretching that uh, because I, I don't want it to end, I guess. Yeah. What kind of music do you listen to, Gina? At the moment, I have this really boring set of playlists that I listen to while I work, which is just like video game soundtracks, lo-fi music, um, and then like instrumental or like orchestral versions of video game soundtracks. Oh, nice. So I, I just listen to those while I'm working because it helps me focus. And then in my um, spare time, I'll just listen to music that has literally been on, been on my liked playlist since I first got Spotify. And so it's just, it, I need new stuff, but I don't know if you guys find this, but because it just recommends to you stuff that 
you've kind of already listened to. I'm not branching mm-hmm. out as, as I did when I was younger because I just used to watch music video channels when I was younger. Right. And so you'd be exposed to all this different kind of music and I had a much more well-rounded um you know, listening playlist. And I like all kinds of music, but yeah, so mm-hmm. I'm just stuck in my lo-fi vibe right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's, um, those are also nice recommendations and inspiration for when you need something to listen to while reading, for example. I'm someone who just cannot have a lot of Silence. I do appreciate silence afterwards, but for working, reading, I need something playing in the background. What have you been listening to lately, Pia? Um, we recorded an episode about In Flames for my other podcast. So I've been listening nice. throughout the whole dist- uh, discography of In Flames. And I also got to listen to the upcoming album Foregone, and it's a blast. So um, <gasps> I didn't like their, their face from... You know, 2011 up until now, mm-hmm. but um, the new album it sums up the band discography in a really cool way, and it continues where they uh, where they stopped albums that I liked a lot. So I enjoyed that really, really, um, yeah, a lot. And also the episode was cool to record because yeah, um, re-listening to a whole discography is always fun. <laughs> But I didn't have time to listen to anything else. Um, I, however, listened to the new single by uh, For I Am King that's called Trojans, and that also fits into this whole sound of In Flames. So that's something I can recommend listening to. How about you? Hell yeah. Uh, when is the new In Flames album coming out, actually? Uh, February 10th, I think. When that's a Friday, then it's February 10th. Nice. Then we can talk about it on the next episode because that is actually one of the uh, few albums that I'm looking forward to this year. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I also listen to the uh, to the singles and it's really cool. And otherwise, I've been listening to a lot of Conquer Divide, Thornhill, mm-hmm. Bad Omens as well. But yeah, I am kind of in the same situation as Gina. I need I need to branch out a little more. <laughs> 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 so if anybody out there has recommendations, and that applies to music, books, games, um, series, movies, anything, just uh, hit us up on Instagram at bleedingmetalpod or bleedingmetalpod at gmail.com. And also in the YouTubes as well, because we are back on YouTube, by the way. Shout out to all of our listeners on YouTube. Surprisingly, there are a lot of people who listen to podcasts on YouTube. So um, we're super sorry for the big disconnection that we had there since we relaunched the podcast. There was this weird pause um, in the automation. So now it's back and I am uploading the older episodes that were missing. So that's what's happening right now on our YouTube channel. That is still called Metal and High Heels, though. And um, yeah, before we start saying our goodbyes, Gina, what, where can people find you? Um, on YouTube, it's Gina Lucia Reads, L-U-C-I-A. And um, I have a website, houselucia.com. And um, you can find the link to Discord and Instagram and all of that on there. Uh, but if you want specific Instagram, it's Gina Lucia reads pretty much everywhere, I think. Yes, and you'll find all of those as well in the linked in the description of this episode. Yes. Right. Is there anything I'm forgetting? I feel like I'm forgetting something. <laughs> Do you want to talk about games or? <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> I just finished Pokemon. Nice. <laughs> what can I do now? <laughs> what kinds of games do you play, Gina? Um, at the moment, I literally only play The Sims. Um, cool. I, it's one of those games that I play to kind of unwind and completely lose track of time. And I used to play it a lot as um, before I went to university and my parents actually had to have an intervention with me because I was not sleeping. Oh, damn. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, or like doing anything other than playing The Sims. So I've gradually brought that back into my life in a much more uh, intentional way. And um, I basically build on The Sims. So I just build um, houses and lots and that kind of thing and it's just a nice way for me to relax 
And because reading is my priority these days, that is basically all I play. Right. How long or how much time do you dedicate to gaming? Um, I probably a few hours every couple of weeks now. Um, there are a bunch of games that I have on my Steam wish list that I would actually like to play. They're mostly, I got sent this, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like a rhythm game that you can play. Um, and it looks really relaxing. Um, and I think those are the kinds of games that if I make time to play, I prioritize because if I'm on my computer, um, I'm usually working. So I kind of want to make sure that anything that I'm on my computer for that's not work is relaxing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I prioritize those kinds of games. Cool. Very important. How about you, Kiki? Right now, I am um, on a new vampire phase, as I have <laughs> announced <laughs> before. <laughs> so I am playing a lot of vampire RPGs from the world of darkness, Vampire the Masquerade, and different types, different versions. So I just finished one that was purely text, but the story was really captivating. And I started a new one that has uh, a little bit more visuals, but is still basically just RPG making decisions and, and those having consequences and stuff like that. It's, it's really cool, actually. Because also for the very first time in my life, I am in a consistent tabletop RPG group. Uh, Gina's partner, actually. <laughs> He's our game master. And uh, it's so cool to, to have that experience of... Um, making a backstory for a character that that you created and just give them feelings and reactions and wishes and all of that is is a really interesting thing that I hope um, you know more people can experience with the Stranger Things boom um, D and D has gotten a lot more attention so uh, it's definitely a recommendation and with that I think we can say goodbye now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening thank you Gina for being our guest here and thank you Kiki for also being around <laughs> as always yes thank you Gina for your time uh, hope to have you back sometime yeah thank you so much for having me you guys are the best right back at you and thanks everybody out there for listening up to here uh, we will or you will hear more from us next month And uh, sooner, maybe even, because mm -hmm. we might be bringing a special uh, bonus segment episode that will air um, sooner. Yeah. Yes. And we will also have another or, or more other awesome uh, guests, just like Gina. So thank you very much for listening and stay tuned. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.